This is Interstates. I'm Alex Chambers, and I'm recording this on Election Day. By the time you're listening, you might know who's going to be the next president of the United States. You might be relieved. You might be devastated. Either way, it might be time to turn your mind to more local and personal questions. So I wanted to bring you a story we aired a while back. It's called The Third Time Rita Left. The story takes place in the fall of 2016, another election season. You might remember. That's in the background, though. In the foreground is my friend Kate and her cat Rita. The story is funny and surprising, and if you haven't heard it already, I think it's worth a listen. Even if you have, it's worth a re-listen, especially right now. A good way to remind ourselves of our priorities. It's four chapters. We'll release them over the next four Wednesdays. Chapter one starts right after this. Okay. Uh, My name is Kate Young. I am the uh, owner of Rita. I don't know. Um, Okay, let me start again. (laughs) I'm not an owner. Um, My name is Kate Young. And four years ago, Rita lived with Kate and her husband, Carl, and their son, Cosmo. They were happy together. Then, one day... For reasons that are still hard to explain, Rita up and left. When I was five, my cousin's cat had kittens, and they gave us one. It was our second time getting cats. The first ones had come a year or two earlier. I'd named them Bibi and Bubba. They were indoor-outdoor cats. They lived with us for maybe a couple months. And then one day they went out and didn't come back. We never saw them again. So then we got Misty from my cousins. Misty was with us about a year, and then she disappeared too. It was December. After she'd been gone a week, we assumed she too was gone forever. It occurs to me now that I don't remember my parents actually making much effort to look for her. I called my mom to ask her about it. Apparently we had looked for Bibi and Bubba. We went around the neighborhood looking, but but no sign of them. I just assumed they found a new home, you know. And we were all very busy because, you know, you were two little kids and Dad had the restaurant at the time and, you know, we kept waiting for them to come back, but they just never did. And we looked for Misty, too. Again, we went around the neighborhood and um, just, I suppose we asked people. We didn't really, we were on the edge of a neighborhood, so we didn't really even know that many people. I don't know what that says about my parents compared to Kate. When Kate lost her cat, she looked for her for months. She went out night after night, morning after morning. That wasn't so much the case with Misty. But then, on my sixth birthday, two weeks after she left, there was a meowing at the door, and there she was. She had kittens a few months later. We kept one of those kittens. I named her Gray. And Misty and Gray, mother and daughter, only about a year apart, lived with us for almost 20 years, till they died of old age. Since I moved out, I haven't had any pets. I'd like to think if I did have a cat, and she escaped, I would be as dogged as Kate was in her search, as dedicated to the possibility of my cat's return, as willing to enlist a whole community to bring a pet back home. Maybe if I'd felt like our country was falling apart and there was nothing I could do to save it, maybe then... In any case, we're not here to talk about me. We're talking about Kate and her cat Rita, who left four times. This is the third time Rita left, chapter one, Losing Rita. We were taking our cats into the vet, not because anyone was sick or anything, but they just uh, needed checkups. Carl asked me, do you want me to come with you? And I said, no, no, I got it. I can handle it. Kate figured she could handle it because they had this big pet carrier they'd gotten from a yard sale. Actually, let's focus on that carrier for a minute. It had come from a family whose kid went to school with Kate and Carl's son, Cosmo. I think it was meant for like a medium-sized dog. And so both of our cats could fit into it. I'm not sure that we had used it for both of our cats before, but we definitely 
knew it was possible. So I just looked up dog carrier brands, and based on Kate's description, it might have been a great choice dog carrier. The top and bottom were separate pieces, held together by clamps. So you can sort of take it apart and clean it or something, or I don't know. But relying on that carrier maybe wasn't a great choice. I should also note that we had had trouble with the pet carrier once before. (laughs) That time, it was Rita's sister, Pingu, who escaped the crate. She had gotten out of it. She just sort of stood there and kind of froze and looked around and walked very slowly. And Carl managed to catch her and put her back in the crate. But Kate was mentally prepared this time. She and Carl wrangled their cats into the carrier. And Kate drove down to the vet on her own with the cats in the carrier in the car. It was about three miles directly south of her house. She passed the high school. She passed the National Guard Armory. She passed the animal shelter. Was that the animal shelter that Rita had come from? No one knows. Except for Kate and Carl. They probably know. She pulled into the parking lot of the vet clinic, that same one where Pingu had gotten out. It's in a commercial part of town. Pretty busy. There's a subway and a Kroger on the corner, a funeral home across the street. Not a place where you'd want a pet to wander around on her own. But that's what the carrier was for. Kate got them out of the car. And as I was carrying them, and I was a little, you know, conscious of the fact that those clips might not hold the weight of these two fairly large cats. So I was kind of holding it from the bottom. I wasn't just carrying it by the handle. In any case, it broke open in the parking lot. And I screamed (laughs) and um, fell down on top of it. I don't know. It was sort of like I I knew this was going to happen or something. But anyway, I sort of threw myself on top of it. And it was too late because Rita had just bolted. I just remember looking up and seeing her backside just hightailing it around the corner of the building. She managed to get the other cat, Pingu, back into the carrier and then back into the car. She was panicking a little. She ran into the vet's office and told them what had happened. They were trying to help. They said, you know, I don't know. I remember one of the vets (laughs) recommending that you should use a pillowcase when you're trying to either catch or carry a cat because it's a way to, it's comforting for them and uh, it's a way for you to really have good control. By the way, remember this recommendation. It's going to come back. Okay, back to the story. And then I called my boss, Amanda, who's also my friend, and she said, do you want me to come down there and help you look? And I said, yes. And so she came down there. Were and you, we're both... like, you were taking time off work at this point to go do this? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah it was some time during the day, and I should have been at work, but I was, I was doing this. So Amanda comes down there. Maybe she brought some cat food with her or something. And so she was leaving work also. She was leaving work also, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so they started searching. Rita had run behind the subway at the end of the strip mall. So Kate and Amanda followed her path. At the back of the strip mall, there were loading docks and a retaining wall. Beyond that, a field and a couple of houses. And... They were both abandoned. There was nobody living in either of the houses, which I thought was nice because then I felt like I could traipse around there without disturbing anybody. And at one point, Amanda was like, I think I found her. And so I go over there to where she is and she's like peering under the house and there is a cat under the house. And for a minute there, Kate thought that was it. I mean, I was like, wow, that's amazing. We found her. Oh my God. You know, I mean, like in those moments before I got over there, I was certain that this was going to be a really quick situation. (laughs) Then Kate looks under the house. And it's not my cat. And then there's kittens. And you know that feeling when reality is suddenly wrong? Like when you were a kid visiting your grandparents and you'd wake up thinking you were in your bed at home, but the walls were in all the wrong places. Or when everyone knows for sure who's going to get elected president. I mean, there's no way to the point where Kate McKinnon is doing preemptive victory dances on Saturday Night Live, and you wake up in the morning ready for her victory speech, and it turns out the orange-faced TV character is about to be the leader of the free world. Anyway, was it, like, surreal or anything, or weird to see this cat with kittens? Like, did you have to, like, adjust? Yeah, it was like, wait, there's a cat, but it's not mine. (laughs) Like, how how can that be? (laughs) (laughs) 
Throughout all this, Kate was panicked. She was crying, worried about Rita. Would she be okay? And then, at the entrance to the basement of one of the abandoned houses... Just hanging from a piece of tall grass... She saw a chrysalis. A monarch. And I'd never raised a monarch butterfly from a chrysalis before. I've raised some other butterfly types. And so I was kind of excited to see it. And I I picked it up and took it with me. (laughs) And ended up putting it in a jar and watching it go through its whole cycle. I don't know what possessed me to think like that that's something I have time to deal with right now <laughs> while I'm looking for my cat, but I just really couldn't couldn't resist it. It was such a cool thing to see. Kate said she took the chrysalis because she wanted to protect it from predators, but she never intended to keep the butterfly. You might say she was fostering it. Maybe she was missing Rita. I really believe that there are many, many ways we can express our love. And one of the ways to express the love is through food. In India, that's what we believe. Is food your love language? Join us each week on Earth Eats for conversations and stories about food and farming. And love. Listen Saturday mornings at 7 and Sundays at 1 p.m. on WFIU or anytime as a podcast. Chrysalis notwithstanding, it was getting clear they weren't going to find Rita. There was just too much tall grass, brush, these kind of wild, abandoned yards. And it just felt overwhelming and impossible to try to find a hiding cat. A cat who tended to be skittish anyway. I I just knew that she wasn't just going to like come out and start meowing at us, you know, (laughs) and we were going to pick her up and take her. So they went back to the parking lot. Kate stopped at every place in the strip mall, asking them to keep an eye out, and gave out her phone number. Then she went home and made a poster with Rita's photo and contact info for herself. She even promised a reward, although she didn't say how much. She took the stack of posters back to that area, brought them into all the businesses, taped them to lampposts, put them up at the bus stop, anything she could find. And that evening, she and Carl and Cosmo all went back, searched some more, got more worried. And it wasn't like, it wasn't the same as like your cat's missing and you're just waiting for them to come back. We knew that she wasn't going to be able to come back. It was just too far away. There was too much traffic. It was three miles of strip malls and high schools, armories and nightclubs. If she was going to make it home, they were going to have to find her. We also knew that she was scared and in an unfamiliar place and didn't know her way around. And so she was going to be hard to find, but also that she wasn't just like, finding another home or hanging out somewhere, you know, (laughs) like, like it was, it just felt like she was experiencing trauma and we needed to find her. That's where the first day ended. She posted on the Bloomington Lost and Found Pets Facebook group. Escaped from a failed pet carrier. On the corner of the building and probably a large dilute calico. Ran off Monday, 9 Please call me at 940 Cash reward for information leading to her rescue. Thank you. And went to bed, still worried. What would you do if your cat went missing? How hard would you search? How many months or years would you hold out hope? What I found kind of amazing was that in the days and weeks after that, Kate's family didn't lose hope. They were convinced Rita was okay, or alive at least, and wanting to come home. There was some panic, plenty of worry, lost sleep. But at that point, it was still just about Rita. Kate knew there were other problems in the world. But in some ways, things were looking up. We were about to elect our first female president, after all. The country she lived in was still recognizable, still something like home. But as she kept looking for Rita, all of that would change. That's it for Chapter 1. Chapter 2 will be out next week. Chapter 2 has Rita's first and second appearances in Kate's life. It also has strangers. I was texting with this person, and at some point I realized, like... And questions. How do I know who this person is and what, you know, like... And questions about strangers. Could this be a trap of some sort? You know, like, like, I'm just... If so, I am falling right into it. That's it for the third time Rita left, Chapter 1, Losing Rita. You can listen to Chapter 2, Finding Rita, 
right now, wherever you got this one. This has been a production of Inner States from WFIU in Bloomington, Indiana. For Rita, I'm Alex Chambers. Thanks for listening. Thank you.